Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's lecture, the Yellowstone Cougar Project with Dr. Colby Anton. My name is Deborah Chase, and I'm the CEO of the Mountain Lion Foundation. But before I introduce our presenter, I'd like to remind you of a few Zoom essentials. We'll have a brief question and answer session after the presentation where you can ask Dr. Anton questions directly. Please use the raise hand tool at the bottom of your screen to queue in for questions. And keep your question brief so that we have time to fit in as many as possible. You can use the chat window to let us know if you are experiencing any technical difficulties so we can assist you in resolving them. Our presenter today is Dr. Colby Anton. He's a native of the Bay Area of California and has been studying large carnivores for over a decade throughout the West. And since 2009, he has contributed to large predator research in Yellowstone National Park. During this workshop, he will discuss key findings from nearly 30 years of cougar research that has shed light not only on their cryptic behavioral patterns and ecological relationships with other large mammals, but also the cutting edge technological advances employed to study large carnivores in the world's first national park. Now, without further ado, we'll turn the time over to Dr. Colby Anton. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction, Deborah, and thank everybody else for showing up today in the middle of the day on a Thursday. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. So thank you for coming today. I'm going to get going on talking about some of the research that we've been doing in Yellowstone on this elusive carnivore, the cougar. So a little quick note about my background. Like Deborah said, I've been studying large carnivores for over 10 years now throughout much of the Western United States, I'm studying a variety of large, large species. I've studied grizzly bears and black bears in Colorado, California, and Alaska, looking at how humans might be impacting these animals, as well as understanding how how hunting might be impacting mountain lions in Colorado. But a bulk of my work has been spent in Yellowstone since about 2009, studying both the wolf population and for the last six years or so, I've studied primarily the cougar population. And I'm gonna be talking about today what I've been spending in the last six years doing for my dissertation, as well as incorporating some of the information that we've learned over the previous 20 plus years um, through other cougar research projects. So a quick overview of what we'll be talking about today. So I first wanna start off with just why we study large carnivores. And this can be for a variety of reasons, but I'm gonna focus on just a couple of reasons. Then we're gonna do a quick orientation to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, make sure everybody understands where we're talking about spatially. And then I'll talk about the history of carnivore management within Yellowstone National Park. And then we'll go into a bit more of the recent research, which uh, has taken a primary focus on cougar population monitoring. And then I'll end with talking about some cougar ecology, as well as some of the behavior that we've been able to shed light on using some of the methods we employ. So to start off, for decades, what we've been seeing throughout much of the world is is some alarming declines across the globe for the largest members of the order carnivora. And these species tend to have high energetic requirements. They can also travel great distances in search of larger prey. And they also tend to exist in low densities with slow life histories. And as we bring all of these traits together, what we find is that large carnivores can be even more vulnerable to different uh, changes on the landscape like habitat loss, uh, persecution and competition with humans for access to prey. And this can be especially troubling given their relative impact that carnivores can exert on an ecosystem through their top-down forces like, pred like predation. But even with all of these alarming declines that we've seen, we also see that in some areas, large carnivore populations have actually been expanding. And further studies of these particular areas we think may provide some key insights into the intrinsic and ex extrinsic forces that allow their proliferation. Now Yellowstone National Park is one of these areas 
where large carnivore populations are proliferating. Now, the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem is a 22 million acre complex of both public and private lands. It's centered primarily in northwestern Wyoming, but it also goes into uh, parts of Montana and Idaho. And at its core is Yellowstone National Park. It encompasses just about 10% of the overall Greater Yellowstone uh, area. And it was the first national park. It was established in 1872. And it was the first national park in the world, I should say. And out of curiosity, I was just curious, how, how many people have been to Yellowstone? There should be a Zoom poll coming up on your screen right now where you can, you can press a, an answer, either yes or not yet. If, you, if it hasn't popped up on your screen, you should see a button down at the bottom that you should be able to click that says Zoom polls. All right, we've got the, uh, the answers coming back. So about two thirds of everybody has actually been to the park. That's awesome. And another 34% have not been there yet. Well, what I hope from today is that that other 34% will get that final push to go visit Yellowstone and see everything that, that it has to offer. For those that have been there, hopefully this will give you another reason to go again. So Yellowstone has a similar history to a lot of the other states, um, especially in the West, where there's a long history of persecution of large carnivores. Um, over the, the turn of the 20th century, we saw some federally directed removal of large carnivores. And in Yellowstone, cougars and wolves were eradicated by the mid 1920s and mid 1930s. Now, bears, on the other hand, were saved from this persecution because they were used as a tourism attraction to try to bring people to the park. Since it was just newly created, they're trying to make it a, a tourism attraction and bring some regional eco economic wealth. And so up in the top left corner of your screen, you can see there was actually roadside bear feeding um, encouraged by the park service. And it was a, a big draw for people to come from all over the country to come to Yellowstone and feed bears. And it's also important to note that outside of Yellowstone now, both cougars and wolves can be hunted legally in Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. Now, for some of you, you, you might be already know some of these things about Yellowstone. In particular, you might already know how we've been able to figure out that some large carnivores can have pretty dramatic effects on their, their surrounding ecosystems. One of the most famous examples of this is gray wolves. Gray wolves were reintroduced in 1995 and 1996 to Yellowstone National Park, and they've flourished ever since. But ever since then, they started studying just how they might be impacting their surrounding system. In this particular plot here, this shows wolves at the top. This is a, a typical trophic, trophic web that we might see where it shows how animals impact other animals in the system, as well as possible impacts on vegetation or even stream morphology or geology. And the different types of lines refer to direct effects or indirect effects. So solid lines indicate a direct effect. So in this particular case, we can see wolves have direct effects on both coyotes and elk. In the case of elk, this would be through, through predating on elk. So actually killing and feeding on elk, and that's their direct effect. Now, in contrast, they have indirect effects. By killing this elk, they actually indirectly affect scavengers like bears and avian species, as well as helping grow woody plants and vegetation through decreased uh, foraging by the elk population. But some of you might be wondering, there's probably some species that are missing from this particular plot here. And if we start to think about how we, we think about Yellowstone, we start to think about how predation alters ecosystems, not necessarily just how wolves alter them or just how cougars might be altering them, but how the, the function of predation might be altering the ecosystem. What we see from this plot over here, I've plotted 
an elk population in white, the cougar population in orange, grizzly bears in green, and gray wolves in purple. Now at the time of gray wolf reintroduction in 1995 and 1996, we actually are also seeing an increase in the grizzly bear population. And just prior to that, about 10 years prior, cougars recolonized the area themselves. So during this time of uh, wolf prol proliferation, we are actually also seeing just a, a total increase in the overall density of our whole suite of large carnivores. And this is important to note because wolves are not the only major player when it comes to predation in Yellowstone. So I'm gonna come back to this idea later on in the talk, but keep this in the back of your mind while I'm talking about some of the other, other things throughout the talk. So in Yellowstone, we've got the full suite of large carnivores that were, that were present prior to the European colonization. This starts off with coyotes, black bears, grizzly bears, gray wolves, and cougars. And all of these large carnivores are competing with each other for access to prey species. And prey species in Yellowstone are abundant. And the most abundant of these prey species is elk. And they number right now somewhere between six and 8,000 animals on the northern part of Yellowstone National Park where we do most of our research. But also competing with elk for access to vegetation, there's also bison, mule deer, moose, bighorn sheep, pronghorn. And so keeping this in mind, we have a very diverse community of both large carnivores and large mammalian prey that they're all competing for. And so what we also have is a rich history of cougar population dynamics research in Yellowstone National Park. Now, as I briefly mentioned a couple slides ago, cougars recolonized the area in the early to, to mid 80s. Now, as I said too, the wolves were actually reintroduced. It was a government program that captured wolves from Canada, brought them down and released them into the park. Now, cougars uh, didn't need that, that human help. They actually were probably existing outside of the park in the vast wilderness areas where humans couldn't quite get to them. And they were able to recolonize themselves back to the area. So after they started to see repeated sign of cougars, they decided in 1987 to initiate the first phase of cougar research in Yellowstone. And so from 87 to 1993, they started studying cougars with the primary idea of trying to get an idea of what's the population estimate during this time frame, as well as um, getting some baseline information prior to wolves being released back onto the landscape. And so this time is characterized by no wolves on the landscape. There's a very high elk density, and they estimated roughly 15 to 30 cougars are now in the northern part of Yellowstone Park. Now, after a brief hiatus of about five years, and after wolves are now in the landscape, in 1998, they came back and did a second phase of cougar research. Now, this time, wolves are now present on the landscape. They're a major competitor with cougars and there's still a very high elk density, and they estimated around 26 to 42 cougars were now on the northern part of Yellowstone. So in phase three, we started this in 2014, and we did some population monitoring for four consecutive winters. We wanted, our, our primary question was how many cougars are now in the study area? And this time was characterized by much less wolves in the area and much less elk. To be exact, there's about 60% less wolves than during phase two that cougars are competing with, but there's also about half as many elk on the study area as there was in the second phase of cougar research. Now, also during this time, the second phase of cougar research, there was a really important research project done. Now, this project was instigated by Dr. Mike Sawaya, and they wanted to understand if you could go out onto the landscape in Yellowstone that already has cougars collared with radio collars, if you can go out and without recapturing those animals or capturing them for the first time, if you can go out and find genetic samples through either hair or scat, if you can gen genetically identify all of the known individuals already on the landscape. And so they tested two different methods. Over here on the left side of your screen, you have your first method, it's called scratch pads. And what you do is you take a little carpet remnant 
and you drill some screws that are facing outward with barbs and you put something really stinky there. In this particular case, there's actually a little pouch of catnip that's supposed to attract cougars to the area. And the hope is that they'll come up and they'll either rub their cheek or they'll rub the side of their body and they'll leave some hairs there that you can then send into a laboratory and identify that individual just through genetics, genetic means. Now, the second methodology that they tested out was over here on the right, looking at that cougar snow tracks. So what they did is they went out on the landscape, they tried to find cougar tracks, and once they did, they either backtrack or front track that animal to try to find scat, or hair left behind at a bed site, or sometimes cougars will actually just walk by a stick and the stick will just snag a couple of hairs right there. And you can actually just genetically identify an individual cougar from just one single hair. And so what they found from this is that the scratch pads did not work, but what they did find is that the snow tracking methodology worked really great. They were able to identify over 80% of known cougars already out on the landscape. Now what's really important for this type of methodology, which is what, what I'm going to talk about over the next few slides, this is what we started doing in 2014, but what's the most important thing about this is, of course, being able to identify cougar tracks and being able to identify and differentiate them from all the other hosts of large carnivores on the landscape. So given that, I've got a quick quiz for you. I've got four tracks up on the screen. You should see some zoom poles coming up for you. The tracks are numbered. And so for each track, go ahead and give your best guess for what you think it might be. And then press submit for each track. And I'll give you a little bit of time for each. And so the question will be, is it a cougar, a wolf, a black bear, or a grizzly bear? And then I'm going to talk about some differentiating characteristics at the end. So, so we got the results back from the first one. It looks like 60% of people said cougar and 38% said wolf. Let's see what the answer is. Cougar. Good job. So let's try number two. So think about some of those differentiating characteristics like shape, um, how the toes are aligned, how the snow might be popping back at you, what shapes that's, that's doing, the overall shape of the track, whether it's circular or more diamond shaped. Wow, 100% said wolf on number two. Wow, you guys are good. Nice job. So let's try number three. All right, this one's tough. It said 42% said black bear and 58% said grizzly bear. This one's tough, it was a black bear. So let's try number four, last one. All right, so the poll results are in. 42% said cougar, 53% said grizzly bear, and we have two and 3% respectively for wolf and black bear. Let's see what it is, cougar. 
So let's look at some of these differ differentiating characteristics we see here. Some of the big ones that we use is for wolf. When you look at that space that's formed in between the pad and the toes, for wolves, we tend to see an X formed that's raised and kind of looking back at you. So look for that X. And this is also true for coyotes and other canids. And then for cougars, instead, we see more of an arc shape or an upside down C. Some other characteristics, we see that there's some asymmetry on cougar tracks. We see that that leading toe on the right is actually forward of that other toe there. Versus with canids, we've got symmetry. Both tracks, both front leading toes are about at the same exact spot. And the final characteristics that I want to show you is the presence of claws. Cougars and other cat species have retractile claws, so they can actually have a, a special tendon and muscle here that can throw their claws out when they want to, like when they're climbing up a tree or if they're climbing up a steep slope or if they're in certain types of substrates. Whereas wolves claws or uh, coyote claws are always gonna be out. And so they're almost always gonna register in the snow or in the dirt. Great, great job everybody. So given what we know about tracking, as you can see, it can be tough, especially given the different types of substrates that animals walk through. What we tried to do during this time from 2014 to 2017 is we, we set up a trapping grid. So all these grid cells were set up in the northern part of Yellowstone. And if you can see my mouse right over here, this would be Gardner, Montana. You can see it written just over there. We have Mammoth Hot Springs right up in here. And this black line is the road that traverses all throughout Yellowstone. And so all of these brown lines are transects that we would either walk weekly or every other week in hopes of trying to find genetic samples. And so along these transects, we would be looking for tracks, like in the upper right hand corner, at which point we would try to follow those tracks to be able to find a hair sample. And these can come in a variety of different ways. Um, for instance, down in the lower left hand corner of your screen is actually a spot where a cougar sat down, where you can see their four paws, their back paws are over there on the far left of that screen. Their front paws are just to the right of those two paw prints. And then you can actually see the little tail swale coming off to the right hand of those tracks. Now when the animals sit down or lay down in the snow, they warm up that snow around them. And then when they reposition, it actually refreezes and then it holds on to that hair. So then when they get up, it actually snags all that hair. And so you can go into these, these bed sites and pick out all these different hairs and they are our best samples for being able to genetically identify individuals. Now, another common bedside is this, this picture down here in the lower middle where they are getting out of the snow. You can see some tracks in the snow going into this little cave bedside where they would bed down. Another common sample that we pick up is a scat sample like in the lower right hand corner of your screen where the animal tried to bury their scat with the dirt and snow. But what can be tough about this is, as you can see, you might be able to hear the animals actually crunching through the snow here if you have your speakers up enough. But you can see this is a family group of four with the maternal female at the very front. We can see that two of her yearlings actually were stepping in the exact same tracks as the, the cat in front of them. And so it can be tough when you start to track family groups to be able to differentiate individuals and make sure that you get a genetic sample from only one individual. And so some of our sampling results from this, this four year effort, we conducted around 635 snow tracking samples, which had us hiking, skiing, snowshoeing around 5,500 miles. And that averaged about 8.66 miles per transect. But we had a, a lot of success, we were able to uh, collect around 833 genetic samples. And it's also important to note, given the type of terrain that you have to traverse when you're tracking cougars, is that you traverse a lot of elevation. So over this time where we hiked about 5,500 miles, we also traversed around a million feet of elevation gain and a million feet of elevation decline. So over the course of four years, the technicians and biologists collectively 
we climbed Everest around 34 times. And so what we do with all of these genetic samples is we send them off to a laboratory and they use something called PCR analysis to molecularly identify individuals using their genotypes. And so of those 830 samples, around 145, so only 17% of all of those samples had enough genetic material to actually yield uh, an individual identification for uh, an individual cougar. Now of that, we were able to identify 39 unique individuals, 20 females, 19 males, and this goes across all age groups. So that includes kittens all the way up to old adult individuals. And this map in the lower left hand corner of your screen shows the, the spatial and temporal makeup of these genetic captures and recaptures. And the triangles signify different females that we captured, whereas the squares signify the males that we captured. And then each of the colors signify the year in which we captured that animal. And one thing to note here is that this high concentration of all of our captures along the Yellowstone River corridor over through this section, kind of the core of our study area. And this is called the Black Canyon of the Yellowstone River. It's a very popular backpacking and hiking area. And it's uh, obviously a very popular cougar area. And the reason for this is because of the terrain that's within this area. So this is looking upriver in the Black Canyon of the Yellowstone with the Yellowstone River down at the bottom. And what we see is this is a very rocky and rugged terrain and cougars love this type of area. And so we had our best luck being able to track and collect high quality samples in the Black Canyon of the Yellowstone. And so what we did with all of these genetic samples is we incorporated them into what's called an open population spatial capture recapture model. And what this is, is a fa fancy terminology that basically says that we go in for successive years of sampling and the first year we see how many individuals and which individuals we capture. Now, when we come back for each successive year of sampling, we look at how many new individuals we captured compared to how many individuals we recaptured from the previous sampling sessions. And using this type of statistical method, we're able to come up with an abundance estimate. So how many individuals actually live in the whole study area. And so what we found for the four years is we saw that about 22 to 23 females were living in the study area and about 12 to 19 males were living in the study area for a total of around 34 to 42 cougars. Now what we also saw is that we were able to identify uh, survival metrics for these animals just through non-invasive genetic sampling. And what this means, this, this metric of apparent survival, it's a metric that gave us around 0.59. And what this means is that every animal in our population has about a 0.59 chance of either surviving to the next year of sampling or that they will set up a, a resident home range in the area. And so since we have a lot of dispersal outwards of our study area, um, we wanna know how many animals, not only will they survive, but also will they not disperse and stay within our study area. And so that's about a 0.59 chance, which is pretty high. Now, the other thing we can do from this is we can look at the growth rate of the population. And this is really important for monitoring populations over long time frames, because we might just wanna know, is the population stable? Is it increasing or is it decreasing? And of course, if it's decreasing, then we might want to go in and try to figure out, well, how can we help this particular population? And so what this is, is this, a, this is called our lambda estimate. And so one is our cutoff. One means that the population is stable. Anything below one means that it's decreasing and anything above one means that it's increasing. And so what we saw is we saw an increasing population through the first two to three years of our population estimation. And then we saw a slight decline in the last year of the population. But when we average those over the four years, what we see is we see a metric of about 1.06, meaning that the population is stable to increasing, which means that's a good thing. Our cougar population is doing well in Yellowstone. And so we plug these abundance estimates back into that plot that I showed you a few slides back. Now, again, the cougars are in orange. We can see that we've got 
these three different phases of study here. We see that there's an increase from the first phase to the second phase, and then it almost seems like it's stable, you know, pretty, pretty flat between the second phase and the third phase. Now, you might be wondering, well, what was going on during the first and second phase to see that pretty sharp increase? But as we remember, the cougars were recolonizing the area in the late 80s and early 90s. And so um, it would be expected that the cougar population would be increasing at a much faster rate when they're starting out at such a low density. And so what we do with this information is we're plugging this into um, uh, much larger models and questions that we're asking about the Yellowstone wildlife communities and looking at overall ecosystem dynamics, multi-predator and multi-prey population dynamics to try to understand how predators might be competing with each other and how these different densities and abundance of predators might be impacting the population dynamics of other species. What's also important to note is that this type of methodology can be really important for state managers because now they can employ this non-invasive genetic sampling, which is much cheaper to be able to employ than going out and trying to capture every animal. They can use this as a tool to be able to monitor how their harvest quotas and management regimes might be affecting the cougar population over longer time frames. Now, another major thing that we've been doing in Yellowstone is we've been using remote cameras on the landscape to study not only behavior and the ecology of animals, but to also keep track of what animals are living in different areas to make sure that our snow tracking was being able to detect them. Now, what's also really cool about these cameras is that they, they sit in a stagnant spot and you get a whole host of species coming by your remote camera. This particular camera here is set on a um, elk migration trail. So every spring and fall, we get thousands of elk coming by this remote camera site. We've also been able to detect almost all other large, large mammalian species in the park on this single camera. Got a cougar up in the upper left hand corner, a bighorn sheep in the upper right hand, and a red fox in the lower right hand corner, and a big bull elk in the lower left hand corner. Now, another thing we do with these remote cameras is we set them on video mode to be able to monitor behavior of animals as they're walking by, or they might be spending more time at particular sites. So this blue line here is one of our snow tracking surveys that we are conducting. And then those little flags that we see with the numbers are actually where we found cougar sign. And in this case, we ended up setting up a camera at this scrape site. And this is a large male cougar that's coming into this scrape site. And these communication sites are really important to a cougar population. Now, cougars in general exist at really low densities. So that means that overall, there's a pretty low chance of coming into contact with any other cougar in the population. So they use these scrape sites to communicate with each other without ever having to actually come into contact with each other. So you can see this male, he's sniffing around, trying to find the scrape itself, which is pictured over here on the left-hand side where you're gonna see him scrape. And they're basically, they're pushing up dirt and then they're urinating on that dirt. And that duff and that pile serves as a way of holding that urination and that scent for longer time frame, as well as a visual cue for other cougars that come in and they'll be able to find that urination right there. And within that urination, there is a whole host of cues and communications that they're sending to other animals in the, in the population. For males like this one, they might be telling other males uh, or trying to figure out if there's other males in the area to see if they need to defend their territory. They also might be looking for females to mate with and a female might come in and urinate and give the cue that she is available to mate. And you must, might also see some kittens and, and female cougars come in to also leave their cues and try to figure out what's going on. Now a female cougar might be coming in for different reasons though. This particular female with two kittens might be coming in to see if there's any males in the area that are not the father of her kittens, that she might need to keep her kittens safe from them. Infanticide by large male toms in a, in a population is one of the major drivers of, of kitten mortality in natural populations. What we also see from this particular video here too is we see that uh, these kittens are learning a lot from their mother in this particular video. You're gonna see a female, she found the scrape site, she's sniffing it, and she's gonna do what's called the Fleming response right there where she's um, using an extra nasal cavity that 
has a extra sensitive um, uh, olfactory uh, nerves to be able to f um, pick up different types of hormone hormones from the urination. And we saw that the kitten learned exactly what to do from that, and they also did the phlegm in response. And we also put these cameras at a whole host of scrape sites to look at how different different species are utilizing the area. In the upper upper panel, we have a cougar that came in. It was a, a female that came in and urinated there. In the middle panel, you have a, a, a pack of wolves come by and the last wolf in the pack decides to come in and, and take a sniff. And then the lower panel is a grizzly bear that decided to uh, make that his home for the about 36 hours. And so this was in about mid-March and this grizzly bear had just come out of hibernation and there he's making himself a little bed and he's going to hunker down in front of our video for quite some time. Uh, we had hundreds of videos of this one grizzly bear in front of the camera. And because it's just too good, I have to show you a few more videos. This grizzly bear was sleeping, but would then wake up, do some yoga moves, and then pass right back out again. Now, the other cool thing that we saw from this grizzly bear was hiking in bear country. Now, they always tell you to make noise. They tell you to carry bear spray. And the hope is that when you make noise, it'll move the animals out of your way. And this goes for cougars and wolves and other animals that you may not want to see. You can make noise, and it gives them kind of that notice to get out of here. So this grizzly bear was fast asleep. All of a sudden, he got up. He heard something, and he sprinted off. Now about a minute and a half later, the next video here is the two cougar researchers coming up the drainage looking for tracks and they were making noise um, and, and uh, happened to, to get this bear out of there before they came up. So um, the safety measures that biologists tell you to do to hike in grizzly bear country do in fact work. So besides remote cameras, we're also employing GPS radio collars. We radio collar a subset of the cougar population and we follow their movements from GPS locations that are taken from the collar. We also fit a triaxial accelerometer in every single one of these collars. And these triaxial accelerometers are basically like a Fitbit. And what it's doing is it's measuring the axes, three major axes of the body, which I'll show you in a few slides, uh, a quick depiction of, but it's measuring these uh, it's measuring movement on these three axes of the body at really high rate and sensitivity, roughly 32 times a second continuously as the, as the collar is out on the animal. And we can do a whole host of things from these accelerometers. We can look at, um, we, we can look at movement signatures of the accelerometer to be able to tie them to um, direct behaviors like walking and running and feeding. Uh, we can also see the exact instant when an animal makes a kill by seeing a surge in the accelerometer data that then shows the animal killing and then it's followed by feeding. What's also really cool about this, similar to what a Fitbit does, is we can actually quantify the energetics of wild animals without um, directly measuring it. So the accelerometers, we can um, look at the volume of oxygen transpired and then we can correlate that to actual calories expended by these animals and we can tie these calories to a whole host of really, really cool ecological questions that I'm gonna tie back into in a couple slides from now. But in order to get these collars on animals, it can be really tough and it requires the help of trained hound dogs. Now, much like we would uh, go out doing a non-invasive genetic sampling survey, we would walk a transect. And once we found fresh tracks, we would let the hound dogs go, at which point they would tree a mountain lion and allow us to get to the tree, at which point we would safely lower the animal down after darting it, of course. So uh, lower the animal down and then we can put a collar on them. We can take uh, blood samples that tell us about uh, the genetics of that animal as well as looking at uh, disease ecology through the population. And then we can also take measurements of the animal and tie these measurements kind of called morphometrics to different age and sex classes of animals to look at how an animal grows over their lifetime. 
But one of the main things that we do with these radio collars is we use them to monitor predation patterns for cougars. Over here on the right shows the movements of F202. She was about, at the time of this plot, was a, a roughly eight-year-old female. And she, we can see from this purple line, this is her um, actual movement path as she came in from the top left of the map. And then we can see this, this white circle here is where we would call the GPS cluster. And we call this a cluster because she spent a lot of time there. And so uh, all of her GPS locations would have been tight and really close to each other. And so what we can do from these GPS clusters is we can identify them on the landscape and then we go out and we hike to every single GPS cluster and we try to figure out if the animal made a kill there, at which point we would find prey remains. And if we do find prey remains, we would try to identify the prey remains to a species and a sex and age class as well. And then the lower left hand corner kind of shows a, a, a rough depiction of how that accelerometer is measuring the animal on the X, Y and Z axes. So studying the predation patterns of these animals for the last five years or so, we, we compiled all of these kills to be able to look at what their diet composition was over this time frame. And what we also wanted to understand is comparing this to the first two phases of cougar research. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, prey abundances have changed. So, uh, elk abundance has dropped uh, during phase three of research compared to phase two. We've also seen an increase in mule deer and white-tailed deer populations. Now what's so cool about that is that we see this reflected in cougar diet composition here. Phase three of research is signified by the white bars here on the plot on your left side of your screen. And so what we see when we compare these white plots to the gray plots or phase two and the black plots were phase one is we see an overall drop in prey comp in elk composition within cougar diets. And they've made up for this by increasing the amount of deer that they prey on. So kind of matching what we were seeing in the field with prey abundances, cougars are, are matching that and also selecting for what's the most abundant and available to them. Now, what's also really cool about cougar carcasses is how we can tell that a cougar most likely made the kill is that they do this really interesting behavior called caching. Now, in the lower right hand corner, this was a, a yearling elk that we found that F202 killed. And we can see that she actually piled a bunch of, of the elk's hair and sticks and duff all up on top of the elk. And we can see this female is also doing this same caching behavior. And what this does is this can reduce the resources of, of the prey that they were able to take down. It can re reduce how much resources they lose to other scavenger species. So as they pile all this duff or snow or whatever is available to them on top of the kill, it can reduce the overall scent that's able to be uh, let out, which would draw in more scavenger species. There's also a couple other hypotheses that um, in wintertime, it might help insulate the carcass, keeping it from freezing and allowing them to feed on it much longer. And also in summertime, it might keep it cooler and making sure that the meat doesn't spoil quite as fast. But there's also, given that it might uh, help reduce um, how scavengers might be coming in, I've got another Zoom poll for you. And my question is, is who is the most dominant during aggressive interactions? So there's four options there, ranked from the most to least dominant. So the left side would be the most dominant animal all the way down to the bottom. So the question would be, if these two species showed up at a carcass, who would end up being the dominant species to be able to take over that carcass?
All right, the results are in. So we had about 9% say A, 13% say D, and a tie 39% to 39% for both B and C. So let's see what the answer is. It's B, grizzly bear. Grizzly bears are the most dominant, followed by black bears, wolves, then cougars, then coyotes all the way at the bottom. Now, of course, some of you might be wondering, can a black bear actually fend off a wolf or a cougar? Um, of course, some of these might be situational. Um, a very small black bear might not be able to fend off a whole pack of wolves. Um, and a whole one single wolf might not be able to fend off um, a large cougar. But in general, this is the social dominance hierarchy that we assign to a complex carnivore system like Yellowstone. And what's important to note here is how far down cougars are on that social dominance hierarchy. In general, what happens is that carnivores are often trying to attempt and they succeed in taking each other's kills. But what's most important for our research is understanding that cougars are often the losers in these particular contests. Now, this can have a couple of different impacts on a particular cougar. Now, as you might imagine, aggressive interactions between two individuals, especially let's say uh, a pack of wolves versus a, a cougar, this could mean that the cougar actually gets killed, which is something that we have seen happen in Yellowstone. But what most, ha most of the time happens is that a grizzly bear or a wolf comes in and they simply uh, boot off the cougar from the kill and they take it over and they feed on the rest of the kill and the cougar loses out on that whole feeding opportunity. And this can have pretty dramatic impacts on an individual cougar. What we found from our accelerometers is that animals, especially mater solitary females, tended to lose their carcasses a lot more often to both grizzly bears and wolves. And what this meant is that they had to expend a lot more energy to be able to go out and make a whole new kill. And sometimes it would be consecutive kills that were constantly taken over. And so over the course of a year or even a lifetime, this could have pretty dramatic energetic consequences for an individual cougar. And this could mean uh, a possibility of missing out on uh, reproduction for that particular year if they're not doing well um, energetically, which can then of course have dramatic impacts on other aspects of their lifetime. But of course, cougars can also help a whole host of species too. Some studies have actually shown that 39 vertebrate species have been found on cougar carcasses. And there's likely a whole host way more than that of invertebrate species that are also benefiting from cougar kills. In this particular case, this is uh, F202 when she was not having a collar with a different uh, litter of, of cougars, of uh, yearlings. And cougar yearlings, they tend to stay with their mother from uh, on average around 18 months, but it can last all the way up to two years of age. And so cats will stay with their mom for a pretty long time. And so what we do sometimes is we happen to get a collar on both the maternal female and one of her young, we can actually track some of these behaviors over time. And so what we saw here is when we had F202 collared, and then we also had her yearling M201 collared. Now F202's GPS locations are here in yellow and M201's GPS locations are here in red. And what we saw here is what we would categorize as predispersal behavior. Now, once the yearlings start to get to a certain age, the female might start leaving them more often. And she might even make a kill, try to leave them at the carcass and not see them for days, even possibly a week at a time. And so what we were seeing in in March of 2016 as we were seeing this behavior. F202 was leaving M201 and his two siblings a lot more often and for longer time periods. Now, originally what we thought is that F202 came into this area called, that we're labeling here the elk calf kill. What we originally thought is that F202 came in here, she made a kill, and then she had M201 and his siblings feed on it. Now we went across the river, we looked across and we could actually see that picture of M201 and one of his siblings right at the elk calf kill. Now what's so cool about this is that we were actually able to use the accelerometer from both animals and see that 
F202 didn't actually make the kill. M201, who was about 18 months old at the time, made his first kill, his first successful kill of a, uh, an elk calf. So these accelerometers were really useful in trying to understand that behavior. Now, what we saw also during this time is that F202 left, and she actually ended up meeting up. There she is right there at the top of your screen. She ended up meeting with an uncollared male that just walked by to the right. And you're gonna see him come back in, into sight here. And so what she was doing is that she was leaving her yearlings on their own. And she was going off and trying to find a mate, which she successfully did. At which point, as soon as her yearlings uh, disperse from her natal range, the, she will pretty much produce a new litter of young uh, within weeks. We happen to have a camera right around the corner too that caught this uncollared male right here. That's F202 on the left-hand side that we couldn't quite see all of her. And when we zoom in on this uncolored male, you can see all these scars all over his face, some notched ears. This is from getting into territorial bouts with other cats. They're using their claws to fight with each other. Um, and he also actually has a, a fresh cut on his lower lip, which could have been from a whole host of things. Um, they also can get injured during hunting elk. Um, but what we saw right after this was that F202 over here in the yellow again, she went with this uncolored male and they made a kill over here, over to um, the right of the original elk calf kill. And what was so cool about this is that this actually ended up being a collared elk that they killed. So we actually had collars from two different species interacting with each other and the elk lost, unfortunately. And what was interesting about this particular kill too is we actually had a grizzly bear come in and take over that kill. And so we can kind of piece together these stories of these individuals, piece together how their ecology and their behavior interacts to try to better understand um, how we can uh, best conserve them. Now, what was so interesting about this is about two months later at the beginning of May, 2016, M201 decided to take his disperse, dispersal. So this is his dispersal route. He started off up here. This purple circle is his natal range. And he traversed this whole eastern side of Yellowstone National Park, which is super rugged. He was going up and over ridges um, and coming down through them instead of taking the easy routes. And then he set up a new home range outside the park to the east over here. And then he was legally harvested on the first day of hunting season in December of 2016. And so this is really important to be able to monitor these animals as they disperse into the surrounding ecosystem. What has been found out is that Yellowstone functions as a source population. So it creates enough animals that repro reproduction is so successful that animals tend to disperse and leave the Yellowstone population and set up shop outside of the park in other parts of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, just like M201 did. But what we also see is that the area surrounding Yellowstone Park is actually functioning as a sink population meaning that survival of animals drops dramatically when they leave the park. And so understanding these source sink dynamics again can start to help us understand how we can best conserve the overall population. Because when we start to think about what's going on with the cougar population in Yellowstone, well, cougars aren't seeing the political boundaries that we place on the landscape, like the park boundary. They, they are seeing the whole ecosystem. And so we need to be starting to manage and conserve them at an ecosystem level. And so in summary, what we've talked about today, we've, we've covered some of the population monitoring that we did through non-invasive genetic snow tracking, where we were able to estimate around 34 to 42 cougars were residing in Northern Yellowstone National Park. We've also employed a, a, a number of remote cameras all throughout the Northern range of Yellowstone to be able to reveal some of the really cool cougar uh, cryptic behavior that they do as well as a diverse wildlife community, the whole host of species coming across our cameras. Now we also employ GPS radio collars with triaxial accelerometers that are helping us monitor predator prey dynamics and how these might be changing over time relative to different prey abundances, as well as um, how large carnivores might be interacting at these kill sites and impacting each other. 
We also use a combination of, of both these GPS collars and, and uh, remote cameras to be able to monitor family group dynamics and be able to see when animals might be dispersing. And then of course, monitoring their mortality and survival rates when they leave the park. And with that, I wanna thank a whole host of people. All of this research wouldn't be possible without a host of technicians, uh, tons of people that were dedicated to the work, um, hiking a lot of miles and elevation every single day to collect the data. And uh, the principal investigators of this project, Dr. Dan Staler, uh, Dr. Mike Sawaya, and Tony Ruth, that all made this project uh, function properly and found the, all the funding to, to help make this a success. And of course, the houndsmen that um, work day in, day out, teaching their dogs and treating their dogs well to be able to, to come in and catch the cougars for this necessary research. And I do want to put in a, a quick plug. If you're interested in learning more about Yellowstone cougars, and the dynamic uh, large carnivore populations there. Um, I do teach a winter field class in Yellowstone through the Yellowstone Forever Institute, uh, where we go out in the field, track cougars, um, and learn a lot more about um, everything that I talked about today. And with that, I would like to open it up to questions. And to do so, There should be a raise hand at the bottom, at which point this will put you in line. And you'll be told when it's your turn to ask a question. Hi, Ted, you're up first. Please go ahead and ask your question. Hi there. Um, I think it was National Geographic I saw um, once they had you know, um, a mountain lion was the victim of a, of a wolf pack. And then it, in the caption and the photo, it said, if, if a mountain lion encounters a lone wolf, it may return the favor. Is that something that you had seen or is that, um, does that ha happen often? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I would say, firstly, it, it does not happen often. Um, but that being said, we only have a subset of the population collared. So uncollared cougars might be interacting with wolves at a much higher rate than we know about. Um, but what we do see is that um, given the certain characteristics, probably um, like you said, the, the makeup of the groups that are coming together. So a single wolf versus a single cougar or the terrain in which it happens, um, it might give one of the species the upper hand in that particular situation. So we have seen cougars kill wolves. And we also have seen wolves kill cougars. So it happens both directions. It's a good question. Hi, Melinda, you're up next. Please go ahead and ask your question. Sure. Um, so I work in uh, California where we don't really have enough snow in one of my areas to make good um, uh, fur capture like you were talking about. Do you have another method that you think works best when there's no snow? Yeah, um, so uh, I actually did my PhD in Santa Cruz and so they obviously don't have any snow there and there's a Puma project there that's been very successful at capturing lions and one of the primary ways of capturing lions when you don't have snow and um, is to use uh, box traps and so you can bait a box trap with um, a deer carcass that you found that the animal killed and uh, then monitor that box trap overnight. Um, and you usually are processing the animals in the middle of the night. Um, that being said, they also employ uh, dogs in, um, in areas with no snow, um, particularly in situations where they're recapturing an animal um, that already has a collar that needs the battery changed um, or a whole new collar put on them. They'll use hound dogs in that particular um, situation. So the dogs are trained well enough, amazingly, to be able to actually track these cougars without any snow. Um, sorry, I was meaning more to get the non-invasive, like genetic material. Oh, track. right, right, right. Um, yeah, so um, that part can be tough. Um, what we were trying to do was focus primarily on bed sites. So that meant um, using remote cameras to monitor trails where we thought uh, we're most likely to find. Uh, cougars, and then trying to figure out um, kind of understanding cougar movements and how they might be using the landscape to try to figure out where bed sites might most likely be, and then try to find those bed sites uh, without any snow. 
Um, the other thing that you might be able to do is, um, you know, brushing trails can be really helpful for at least trying to find um, tracks in the first place. And so that would be going to a trail that you think is most likely to be used and brush it with just a, a broom to give you kind of a clean slate. And then you can check it uh, first thing in the morning to see if any cougars came through and they should be the, the only tracks there. Um, there's also been some research in trying to figure out some other methods, uh, which is, you know, focused primarily on how how could we lure cougars into a particular location that would then have kind of the barbed screws or uh, barbed wire that could then snag hair. So instead of kind of passively collecting genetic samples, that would be kind of more actively trying to lure the animals into you and then have some sort of contraption to, to catch hair. Hi, Lee. You're up next. Please go ahead and ask your question. Looks okay. like maybe Lee got her question answered. Um, okay. Let's move on to Bob. Bob, please go ahead and ask your question. Hey, thank you for the uh, webinar. Really appreciate it. Uh, I wonder if uh, you folks have done any calculations using your accelerometers to uh, try to determine kind of what's a top speed of a uh, cougar when it's making its attack or in any case, doing a rapid acceleration? Um, we have not done that with our data. Um, what can be really helpful with um, trying to do that is when you have a GPS fix rate that's very small. And by that, I mean, you can program these GPS collars to take a GPS fix rate at an interval that you desire. So that can be um, every hour, every three hours, once a day, and in cases like that, where you want to try to really measure movement speed at a high rate, you would want to get a GPS fix rate closer to around one minute, which you can do. Um, but of course, that's going to drain the battery of your radio collar. So uh, we prefer to leave our collars out for a longer time frame. Um, so we have not done that uh, in our particular study. Now, what I have heard is that um, cougars can run at speeds similar to some of the other uh, large carnivores, around 30 to 35 miles per hour with the difference being that cougars tend to focus on short bursts of speed. So they can do that really quick burst of really high amplitude, um, fast pace versus, you know, a wolf can keep that up for much longer distances. Um, and that has to do with their, their overall body morphology and how um, evolutionary history has changed that between the two species. Hi, Haven, you're up next. Please go ahead and ask your question. Hello. Uh, Hi. So thank you so much for that fascinating presentation. Um, do you have any data to suggest that the bears actually follow the cougars around to get their prey? Or do they simply do it when the prey, when the dead prey starts to smell? Um, we don't have any data to support that. Um, what we think is going on is that they're opportunistically searching the landscape and happen to come upon the prey carcass that the cougars um, killed. Um, and so we think it's more of an opportunistic thing uh, where grizzly bears are out foraging since they have a, they have a really flexible diet. They can, they can eat a whole host of vegetation species as well as meat. Um, and during certain types of the year, they might be focusing more on one of those groups of, of diet preferences. And so we see some seasonal differences in how grizzly bears might be utilizing uh, cougar carcasses as well as wolf carcasses. Um, but we think it's more of an opportunistic thing where they happen to come upon um, smelling it from some sort of distance depending on uh, terrain and other things and um, certainly go in and try to take it over immediately if they smell it. That's a good question. Hi, um, it looks like we have a question from B. Murphy, but um, my system is telling me that for some reason you aren't able to ask it. So B, could you go ahead and type your question into the Q&A? Apologies for that. And we're going to um, move on to uh, Helen, Helen while B finishes typing in their question. 
Helen, please go ahead and ask your question. Yes, uh, I bought this book by uh, Tony Ruth, uh, Polly Beauty, and Maurice Honecker called Yellowstone Cougars. Is your study entirely independent of that study? Yeah, so that's a really great book that just came out in the last year, and that summarizes the first two phases of cougar research in Yellowstone. And they were writing that and finished that book actually prior to us even starting the first, uh, the third phase of cougar research. Um, but you bring up a really great point that everybody else should know about that if you want to know more about the first two phases of cougar research, that book is amazing at uh, being able to explain a lot of these really complex ecological uh, processes that we've been able to see in Yellowstone. Um, next up, we have Janice. Janice, please go ahead and ask your question. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, thank you for your presentation. And I feel like my question might be kind of maybe dumb, but they say no question's a dumb question. I agree. Um, I just wonder how um, genetically closely related is the American puma and I know that they exist clear down to what South America also and clear up into Canada. Um, has it been determined how closely related that they may be to the African lion? Has that um, been determined? Um, so they've determined that they are a completely different species so that that separates them genetically. And that's one of the primary methods that they're able to identify species as they look at um, the genetics of, of each individual to be able to make those delineations between species. Um, they're both in the same family, so they're both uh, felids, and so they're um, related in that sense, um, but they're um, fairly far apart on the genetic uh, lineage. Colby, our next question is from B. Murphy, and they ask, what brand of trail cam do you prefer for monitoring cougars? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so when we first started out, we were using Bushnell cameras. Um, and since then, uh, we've made a switch over to the Browning cameras. Um, and some of the nicer video quality that you saw in my presentation were from the Brownings. And they've been able to, um, they have really good battery life and they also have really high resolution um, for the videos. Um, what I really particularly like about them too is they have really good nighttime videos, um, which is one of the hardest ones to find as a, as a camera that can do really nice nighttime video. Colby, a couple of folks have asked us to, if you could repeat the name of the book um, on phase one and two that you mentioned. Yes, so um, the book is by uh, Tony Ruth. Her last name is spelled R-U-T-H. She's the primary author on it, but there's also two other authors named Polly uh, Buot, which is B-U-O-T-T-E. And the last author is Morris Hornocker, H-O-R-N-O-C-K-E-R. And what it is, it's called um, The Ecology of Cougars Before and After the Wolf Reintroduction. And you should be able to find that um, online from a whole host of uh, uh, different publishers and sales. Thanks for that. Um, Bill, you're up next. Go ahead and ask your question. Bill, are you there? I'm sorry, Dr. Hey. Adnan, this is an excellent presentation. We've really enjoyed it. Oh, um, I have a question going back to early in your presentation when you explained that the sticky pads did not work well for mm -hmm. hair retrieval, um, but you never really explained why. What, what, were, what was the flaw in that? Well, so sometimes when we employ methods, especially like this, um, we don't necessarily know why they don't work. Um, what we can see is that um, cougars would sometimes come within even 10 to 15 feet of the scratch pads that are tacked onto the side of a tree and they wouldn't visit the, mm -hmm. the scratch pad. Um, now, we just don't fully know why that didn't work very well, 
um, that particular methodology actually works really well for bobcats, which is why um, they decided to try it for cougars. And so it might just simply be um, that cougars are just not quite as um, tuned in to something like that. Um, maybe the, the scent that that was being used wasn't quite as good to, to bring them in close enough. Um, if, if you think about kind of what would be required, we're talking about, you know, a really small carpet remnant that you need this cougar um, to be traversing this vast Yellowstone landscape and find this small carpet <laughs> remnant. So I think that's kind of one of the big issues is that you need this cougar to come into this small area versus the snow tracking gives this really nice flexibility of a biologist to go out and find the tracks and then and then be able to follow that animal wherever it went. Um, so there's certainly a lot more flexibility in the snow tracking method. Thank you. Hi, Greg, you are up next. Go ahead and ask your question. Uh, make sure you press unmute, Greg. Thank you. You bet. All right. So I just wondered about the cougar population um, after the reintroduction of wolves. Um, anything in particular? Uh, did it go up or did it go down? You know, how was it impacted by the wolves? Yeah. So initially it went up. And this was partially because of um, kind of a low starting density of cougars. And so they were increasing their population simply because there was no cougars there before. Um, but then after that, we actually saw a decline in the cougar population. Um, part of this was from uh, lower kitten survival. Um, and also because they were changing their behaviors. So cougars were actually changing how they selected different types of habitat. And what we think is um, trying to avoid some of that risk associated with coming into contact with wolves. Um, the really important thing to remember about this time is in this particular study area, there was upwards of, of 100 or more wolves in the study area versus now we're looking at somewhere between 30 and 40. So a very big difference in how many wolves were in the area which overall for an individual cougar back in the mid 2000 or early 2000s, they were encountering a lot more risk from an interaction from a wolf on, on the landscape. All right, thank you. Hi, Bethy, you are up. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, I was wondering if you've used any of the genetic samples to look at family relationships among the individuals or maybe how how much of the population is coming in from outside versus interbreeding? Just wondering if you could speak to that at all. Yeah, that's a great question. And that is one of our questions that's kind of on deck right now. We have um, a really great genetic data set and we wanna ask some of those questions um, that you just mentioned. Um, initially, what we've been able to do is, is simply take genotypes from those individuals and we were able to uh, match those up with some of the field observations of family groups to see if the genotypes match up um, to show that a maternal female is in fact the mother of, of her offspring. Um, but we're still planning on looking at uh, the genetic diversity of the population. And what's really cool about that is that we actually still have all the genetic information from the second phase of cougar research. So we, we should be able to look at uh, the genetic diversity of the population and compare uh, both the second phase with the third phase, as well as looking at what genetics might be persisting through the population and different types of lineages that might be there. Hi, Lisa, you are up next. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Colby. I just wanted to know whether you feel like um, that the carrying capacity of Yellowstone for cougars is at its maximum or not at this point in time? Um, I guess all I can say is that we see that the cougar population has been stable now for um, roughly 10 years or, or more than 10 years, almost 15 years now. Um, whether or not it's at its maximum capacity, um, that I don't know. Um, but what I do know is that uh, the population seems to be stable enough to be holding uh, pretty similar numbers from year to year. 
Um, so it does seem as though um, the numbers that we're seeing right now seem to be um, what the landscape can handle as far as um, other interactions with other carnivores. So um, this, of course, is in line with how many wolves there are in the landscape, how many bears there are in the landscape, and then how many prey species there are in the landscape. Thank you. Uh, but, we, but we haven't, just to be clear, we haven't quite figured out, you know, what is the maximum carrying capacity of Yellowstone for, for cougars. Thanks. Hi, Ashley, you are up. Go ahead and ask your question. Good afternoon. Thank you for um, this great presentation. I was curious, um, you had stated that Yellowstone was a source population and then adjacent lands were, um, you know, a bit of a scene. Is, is the, um, do you know if the states involved or the, the um, federal agencies or nonprofits are um, getting together to address that issue in any way? Um, not that I know of. Um, what we do see is that, you know, there's a lot of protected land around Yellowstone. And so the idea is that animal, at least some animals are able to disperse pretty long distances um, and spread their genetics into other populations. Um, and there's, there's certain, at this point, there's no thought that the population around Yellowstone is declining or in danger of, of any major declines. Um, but that being said, uh, right now, the state of Montana has changed the way that they estimate their populations. They're actually using a a method that's very similar to what I described, where they actually send out houndsmen uh, with dogs and they tree cats and they do what's called a biopsy dart, which is a gun with a hollow tip dart. And they um, dart the animal and the dart just comes right back down to the ground with a little small, very small plug of tissue where they can run genetics on animals. And so they are going to be estimating the population of cougars throughout the state of Montana and getting these genetic samples from all over the place, at which point they'll be able to better assess how they do cougar management on, on, a, on a much larger scale and what, what uh, many are referring to as a much more kind of e ecologically relevant scale. Um, so um, in short, the answer is there's nobody specifically looking at um, you know, how to change the source sink dynamics, um, and, but that's partially because there's, there's a bit of a dearth of information on what's going on exactly with the population outside of the park. Hi, Kobe. Natasha had asked us, how strenuous is your winter field course? Yeah, so um, we, we hike around uh, five, mile, five to six miles a day, and we climb around 1,000 feet over those five or six miles. Um, but we tend to be outside for, um, you know, eight hours each day. Um, so depending on how cold it is in that particular winter, it can be tough for some. Um, but I, I wouldn't call it overly strenuous. Uh, we take lots of breaks and uh, look at uh, the awesome landscapes of Yellowstone, um, um, but it certainly is not gonna be something where you'd wanna come straight off the couch and come into the class. Hi Janice, you are up. Please go ahead and ask your question. Hi, sorry for the second question, but it just came to me. Um, I know about the why to Y initiative, mm -hmm. Yellowstone to Yukon. And I wonder, um, this might be like a two part question, how that's progressing. And um, if you think that that's gonna help um, the animals, cougars in particular, to have um, more territory to tra traverse back and forth and for genetic um, diversity. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for those that, uh, don't know what that is, the Y2Y -Y initiative is trying to figure out if we can create a, a full corridor all the way from the Yellowstone area all the way up um, to the Yukon area and ensuring that wildlife can move freely across um, that entire region. Um, and certainly if, if that whole area is able to be conserved or if corridors are able to be conserved, it, it will certainly help um, all species of animals. Um, and that would be through uh, decreased mortality associated with, you know, getting hit by a car on the road, um, as well as increasing the genetic diversity of a whole host of species. Thank you. 
Colby, Chelsea had asked us in the chat, what inspired you to, to study cougars? Yeah. Um, what inspired me? I, I guess I've, I have been fascinated by them for a long time. Uh, when I first started out out of college, I, I started studying gray wolves right out of college. And that was in Yellowstone. Um, and started learning about cougars there. And um, their types of behaviors really fascinated me, how cryptic they are and how they're able to stay hidden, um, even in areas where there's lots of people living. Um, they're, they have this, the largest distribution of any land mammal in the Western hemisphere, largely because they're capable of existing around humans because they're able to be so cryptic. Um, and also what really fascinated me is how successful they are with capturing prey. They're one of the more successful animals with, um, you know, how, how many hunts they conduct versus how many successful hunts they conduct. They, they can be really successful and um, they're taking down a, a, an adult elk that might be four times their size. Um, so I guess the, their behavioral systems really fascinated me starting out. Um, and then their ecology kind of really wrote me in on uh, finding that really interesting. And then finally, what was uh, kind of the last dagger for <laughs> studying cougars was how hard it was to study them. Uh, by far the hardest field work I've ever done, um, some of the, the hardest analyses I've ever done have been focused on uh, cougars um, because, because they stayed hidden. Uh, you have to go to extra lengths to be able to study them. Hi, Ted, you are up. Please go ahead and ask your question. Hey there. I was just, um, I went to the Yellowstone Forever website and, the, and it says like the programs are on hiatus due to the pandemic. Do you expect anything to go on this winter? Um, they kind of have us in limbo at this point. Um, so it may not go on this winter. Um, I guess it's seeming more and more like it won't go on. Um, mm -hmm. This particular course has been taught for over 20 consecutive years. So this will be the first time it hasn't been taught in a long time. Um, so as soon as uh, the pandemic's over and they give the go ahead, uh, we most certainly will be um, putting on the Cougar class again. So um, keep your eyes peeled for it. Oh, great. And what, what um, time does it generally happen? What, uh, uh, yeah, we try to do it sometime in January. It tends to be uh, mid to, to late January. Okay, great. Thank you. Hey, Colby, I see a few more questions in the chat. Um, Lee had asked, do you need the hair follicle to get DNA? Yeah. Um, so the question is, do you need the hair follicle? And what we actually need is we need the root of the hair follicle. So um, as you imagine, all, all of our own hair, um, it goes into the epidermal layers. And when you pull out a hair, there's usually like a little bit of epidermal layers stuck on the end of that hair. And that's actually what we need that has the genetic material. The rest of the hair is pretty much useless to us as far as genetic material. You can do other things with the rest of the hair, uh, but we need the root follicle. Another question for you from Don, who was asking in that chart that you showed with cougar prey, what falls under the other prey category? Yeah. Um, so. Uh, what falls under the other prey, it can be a whole host of things. They actually have a pretty diverse diet when it comes to other prey. Uh, we tend to see a peak in selecting other prey in the summertime when small mammals are more abundant. So uh, what we have that falls into this are uh, beaver, uh, a lot of marmots, um, even a ground squirrel has been found. Uh, several bird species have been found like grouse. Uh, we also have, uh, they prey on red fox and coyote. Um, so it tends to be a lot of these kind of other small, small species that make up around 1% of their total diet. So we don't give them their own uh, bar. That's a good question though. Um, MJ asks, have the collared cougars ventured outside the park and what is their average territory size? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, cougars do, from our study, uh, collared cougars do venture outside the park, um, especially in the northern part of the park in wintertime. Uh, we do see a lot of our collared cats uh, venture, you know, outside of Gardner, um, and then a lot of animals disperse and leave the park with collars on. 
Um, and home range sizes can vary uh, depending on um, the age or sex class. Um, so male, males can be pretty large. They can be you know, over 400 square miles, uh, whereas females are, tend to be kind of closer to um, you know, 60 to 100 square miles. Another question from Allison who asks, how many of kittens are killed by other predators when left for a period of time by their mom? Yeah, so um, kind of looking at uh, kitten survival. Um, kitten survival for cougars is very low up until about six months of age. So um, when they're first born all the way up to about six months old, um, that's the toughest time for them. And if they can make it through that, then they have a pretty good chance of surviving till adult, adulthood. Um, we, on our particular study, don't collar kittens uh, to look at survival. Um, the two prior studies in Yellowstone did collar kittens, um, but unfortunately I'm blanking on the overall percentage of, um, of loss to mortality to wolves. Um, but they, do, they can die from wolves and black bears, grizzly bears, coyotes, um, this is why they, they tend to choose a, a nursery site that's really well hidden and um, they don't defecate at the site or if the kittens do defecate, the mother will actually remove the defecation and move it far away from the site. So again, getting back to that really cryptic behavior, um, they try to keep their nursery site very clean to try to keep the scent of the, the animals down. Um, they tend to choose a lot of like rocky areas with nooks and crannies that they can really hide in. Um, Helen asks, was your study independent of the study published in the book Yellowstone Cougars this year? And did wolves kill any of the cougars you studied? Yeah, so our study was independent of that book. Um, that book's um, focused only on the first two phases of cougar research. Um, and we came in to kind of revisit some of the questions that they found and we're asking new questions because of um, some of the other dynamics that have changed in Yellowstone. Um, and, oh geez, what was the last question? Oh, have, have any cougars been killed? Uh, yes, um, so F207, she was a collared female. Um, she was actually killed by a pack of wolves uh, not too long ago and um, about six months prior uh, we believe that her um, one or two kittens were also killed by wolves. Um, Brianna asks, do you have any advice for a recent grad trying to get into cougar research? Uh, yeah, uh, apply. Uh, keep applying to as many jobs as you can. Uh, keep contacting people. Um, you never know when they're going to have an opening on their projects. Um, you know, it, it can be a little tough right now just because of COVID. Uh, it seems like a lot of funding has been lost to some of these really needed wildlife projects. Um, uh, if you're really focused in on mountain lions, you might lose out on some other really cool opportunities to study other species. Um, so I, I would urge you that if um, you know, mountain lions is kind of like your end goal for trying to get a job in that, um, you know, if, if you can't get that right away, uh, making sure that you get some other experience um, that might lead you uh, to mountain lion research in the end. Miguel asks, is there any current research weighing the impact of potentially connecting the Yellowstone ecosystem, Bob Marshall Complex, and Glacier National Park? Um, I don't know of anything that looks specifically at those particular areas. Um, but all of those areas are included in that Yellowstone to Yukon initiative. Um, and they have, if you Google Yellowstone to Yukon or Y to Y, um, their organization should come up and they're trying to create some uh, nice corridors for all species to be able to travel throughout all those complexes. Let's see, Dick asks, what is the story behind the picture of the man holding the huge cougar? Oh, the, the hunter? Um, I, I actually don't have a story. I, I simply uh, Googled cougar hunter and that was one of the photos that came up. If you look up cougar hunting, almost all the photos are like that. Um, 
those cougars, um, the way you take photos can make the animals look really big. And the reason that all the hunters do that is because um, that way of holding the animal and then positioning the camera down low makes the animal look enormous compared to the human. Um, and that's why you, you hear some kind of outlandish ideas of how big that cougar might have been. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't have a particular story behind it. Kobe, I think we have time for one more question. And I okay. see one from Francesca that says, what can I do as an individual to stop hunting and killing of these beautiful animals in and out of wildlife preserves? Um, uh, you know, if you're really passionate about ending all hunting, um, you, know, you can contact your local wildlife officials and contact your congressmen and senators and um, as well as you know, giving to organizations like MLF that are trying to help cougars um, in a variety of different states throughout the West um, to try to get state agencies to use science-based um, management tools um, and not just management for the sake of political reasons, but making sure that management tools are backed up by um, good science. Is that the last question? I believe so. Thanks, Colby. Yeah, you bet. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Appreciate you taking the time to, to come out.